Ah, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. From the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios, I am Andrew Wiebe with my partner in soccer, who else? Josie Altador. We have a huge interview for you today. Been working for years to get this one done. One of the strongest, most interesting personalities, one of the best players in the American game. Josie, of course, just signed on with the New England Revolution for three seasons. They're chasing MLS Cup and maybe CCL2. I sat down with him on Tuesday for a wide-ranging conversation I think you will really enjoy. Without further ado, it's an AT&T 5G call to the field. Josie Altador. All right, a very special guest on Extra Time. Haven't talked to him on this show, but Josie Altador is here in New England. Josie, what's up, man? Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, man. Love your stuff. Love what you guys are doing. So happy to be on your show today. Hey, just just happy you're back. We'll talk more about it. There were a lot of scenarios flying around. I was hopeful to be MLS so I could get to watch you and talk about you and see what you're doing every single week. We'll talk soccer. Don't worry about that. I want to start you with something more important. That happened on New Year's Day. You're a married man now. You and Sloan made it official, tied that knot. Uh, You did it, though. It's a weird time to do it, I guess, in your personal life, too, because COVID happened. You have you don't have a club at the time. Tell me about this process of getting married on New Year's Day and what was going around in your mind, her mind, your family's mind as all this goes down. It's actually funny you ask that because, you know, the club stuff, it was all flying around, you know, even before our last game. It was it was crazy in in Toronto with with the club stuff. But. Because we were getting married, I put everything off um, and wanted to focus on that. You know, you know, we both live crazy lives and I owed that to her to, to block out everything and focus on, you know, planning this wedding and make sure everything went well. Because like you said, COVID is challenging and we had to make sure everybody got tested. And if you tested positive, you were out. We had tests literally every day. So it was some serious business. She did not play with that. And, you know, it had to be that way, right, with, with where we are in the world of COVID. So um, it was it was an event. And, and I'm happy it went so smoothly and beautifully. Uh, I couldn't have hoped for a better event. It was great. What was the detail you cared about? Like the thing that you're like, okay, most of this, I'm going to just, I'm going to go along with what you're thinking, <laughs> but there's the one or two things that everybody truly does feel really passionately about. What were those for you? Um, the after party, man. I wanted the after <laughs> party to be, to be fun. That was my biggest thing. I wanted everybody to have fun and, and just be able to, you know, we're not huge. She's not a huge party person, but I, I told her, you know, we got to make sure we jam out with our loved ones because everybody kept telling me before, like, you know, make sure you step out, you know, and just, you know, take it all in that you have everybody that loves and supports you in one place and that that doesn't happen many times more. So I just wanted to make sure we, we gave them the best party possible and, and it was amazing. It was better than I ever imagined it would be. And I'm so happy we got to do it at the time we got to do it. I'm a crier. I'm going to just say that. I, I definitely yeah. was, when I got married, I was crying up there. I saw some photos in yeah, Vanity Fair, I want to say. Had something yeah, you had, you I mean, something, I mean, what emotion for, yeah, for you, what was that, <laughs> what was it like, that, that, that moment for you? How many emotions were going through you? You know, it was a lot because, you know, it, you can play it in your head, as you know, many times, but to, to live it, you know, to see my son walk down the aisle and smiling with my mom and, you know, I was nervous for how he was going to do and he killed it. He was great. And then obviously to see my, my, my wife walk down, it was it was surreal. She looked so beautiful in her dress and just the moment you see all your family and everybody's emotional and it, it's tough to keep it together in that moment. But uh, like I said, it went it went exactly how I, how I envisioned it and beyond. So. It was emotional, but it was good emotions, right? Happy emotions. Yeah, for sure, man. I was reading Sloan's blog, and she's it's super interesting. Yeah. Uh, but one line in there stood out to me. It was, quote, I married the same man who literally threw me in the trash when I was a oh. little girl. <laughs> so I got, that sounds like prime, like, 11, 12-year-old <laughs> flirting right there, Josie. I'm not going to lie to you. That's like you're on the playground, and you're like, you, you see the girl you like, you're always going to tag her when you play tag, yeah, or you're going to yeah. mess with That sounds like, sounds like you might have had a feeling early, early days on this one. Man, let me tell you, she always used to, you know, it's literally one of the TV shows. I, I close my locker, boom, and then boom, she's standing right there and just like, <laughs> so what are you doing today? And I'm like, oh, my God, she was that little, like, not a pest, but she was just always around. And you low-key liked it, but, you know, it was more of a, a little sister vibe at that time. And, and yeah, I mean, we, we kept the same relationship. You know, we kept in touch over the years a little bit. And, you know, we met up in the January camp for dinner and, Literally, it was the same person I had met all those years ago, and I couldn't believe it. So, you know, I'm very lucky to have somebody like her in my life. And, uh, yeah, she's, she's a special, special person. 
this relates back to the Revs, and we'll get there after this one. I'm a big New Year's resolution guy. I don't know if you are. It seems like Sloan certainly is. Would you share with us any of your uh, any New Year's resolutions? What are the things you're thinking about in 2022? Um, just to just to be happy and enjoy enjoy my work, you know, for both of us, you know, we've got a lot to deal with outside noise and all that stuff. And I just want to enjoy my work. I love the game and I'm just excited to get to, to playing again. You know, um, it's been a weird couple of years. So just to, to get back on the field and just play has been great. So that's my resolution. Just enjoy and smile on the field and just enjoy it because. Who knows how much longer we got, right? You know, I'm on the wrong side of 30 in a way in terms of like, you know, sports. So I want to enjoy my my time and enjoy every game and training and and, and locker room stuff and just, you know, being part of a team. Why the Revs? I mean, I heard so many rumors and I I was trying to start as many as I could as well with zero information, (laughs) by the way. But, you know, South America was here and and like I I want half of me is like, yeah, go to Liga MX. That would be so fun. Like just to watch you in Mexico. And obviously we just saw you on the press conference. I mean, your Spanish is just, you know, you would have fit you would fit in perfectly down there. And then selfishly, I wanted you in MLS. So what was this process like? You got married. You gave Sloan that time. You gave yourself that time to breathe. And then the process starts. And what does that look like for you? Yeah, so that's where that's where it became sticky because of how we how we did it. Um, you know, waiting obviously until after the wedding, it kind of was like boom, you know, real fast, and then just trying to look at things. And South America was was definitely something I was excited about, and Europe, you know, the competitor in me has some beautiful options. But it's tough, man, because you're a dad now too, you know. And my son, and, and thinking about it, so much he's sacrificed already, you know, I didn't know if that was fair to to put him in that environment, you know. Um, it wasn't going to be a bad environment, but I just felt like, you know, I had to think of him, my wife's career um, and those type of things really, really, really important at the end of the day. And, and to make sure she was able to get what she needs out of whatever market we're in. And my son, you know, being in the United States, come on, it's it's second to none with, with those kind of things. So that weighed on me a lot up until the last minute. Um But at the end of the day, you know, happy wife, happy life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and not only that, but. You know, I also wanted to make sure I found a challenge within wherever I went. Um, and New England's not going to be easy. You know, obviously, you play on the turf. You know, there's there's a target on the team's back, and and there's competition for places. It's a it's a team that plays at a very high level, so uh, it's no slouch of, of an opportunity. And and so when I when I knew that the opportunity was there, I was very very excited about it. And then to work with a winner and Bruce is is obviously something that's exciting too. He knows how to win in this league. He's done it for a number of years. And the, the, the quality in this team was very exciting, um, from Carlos to Adam to to Andrew to to obviously Matt Turner. It's a very very high level team, so that that really excited and intrigued me. And I'm happy in the end that it can get done. When you think about this opportunity from a, a family standpoint, I heard you say you had a brother in Boston, yeah. and then Sloan has family. I mean that yeah. that feels like. You're thinking about your professional side and your personal side, but if your personal side is good, your professional side is going to be that much better. I mean, how, how does this sort of free you up? Yeah, in theory, right? That's exactly what you just said, right? So obviously, you know, Sloan's family history is huge here. Dad played at the Patriots. Her mom was, an, uh, you know, uh, an all-star and an all-American, I believe, swimmer here. You know, her mom lived here for a number of the year, a number of years, knows the area really well. My brother lives here with his family, so that was kind of cool. You know, how many times in your career are you going to have that option to to play around so many close loved ones on both sides of the of the of the spectrum? So that was huge for us. That was a huge, huge uh, talking point for us during this whole process. And so, um, obviously, like you said, if you have that you know family type of environment right, then it, it frees you up on the field. So. Hopefully, obviously, you have that one-two punch, but obviously the family aspect was huge for us in, in choosing Boston. I know a lot of people might have been like, you know, whoa, whoa, but for us, that was huge. That was huge to be around our loved ones when we're not able to because we're both traveling a lot, and it uh, made it a lot easier. You had a quote in your presser that was, you can't beat father time. I just heard you say you're on the wrong side of 30. A lot of us out there nodding our heads on that one. Uh, but look, I, I also think, you know, Lewandowski, he's over, he's like 33. Kareem Benzema's 33. Robbie Keane and David Villa won MVPs at this age. Like, yeah. you, you're you're not old, man, but how does no, the body no, feel? No, no, How I'm does the body saying, feel? I feel great. I feel, I feel like I, I feel like I was, if I'm 22, man, I feel amazing. I, I just mean in the sense where, you know, your decisions are different at this age in ah. terms of, you know, 
what you're looking for, what you want to be a part of. And, and that family aspect is amazing. And so, you know, when you're younger, I feel like you can take maybe in my, in my, in my opinion, you can maybe take more risk in certain areas and, and, and be more of a daredevil. But when you're a father, you're 32, you know, you have a wife, you know, you have to be kind of smarter in, in terms of, you know, what you're looking for, what you're looking to do and what situations you're trying to put your family in. So that's what I meant more of there. Not, gotcha. not the sporting wise. I, I'm just, yeah, not, you're not, you that don't have to cane out yet. Right. Yeah. Nah, yeah. I'm just as excited as I was, <laughs> you know, my rookie year, you know, that, that never goes away. That competitive spirit never goes away. How, how is your body though? Cause we haven't seen a ton of you. So do you feel, feel like you feel yeah, great? I feel good. You know, the, you know, that, that's, that's the, the part that is disappointing a little bit, you know, there was a lot of periods where I was, you know, taking painkillers, you know, shooting whatever in my booty in terms of uh, pain yeah. medicines, numbings to play. And I'm human, man. Everybody's human. Sometimes that stuff comes back to you. You know, it comes back what you do to your body. So I had a rough couple of years in that aspect, but that's normal. And it's a shame that it was, you know, it happened how it happened. But I feel great. You know, I had to have the surgery on my foot. You know, I broke my foot in the MLS Cup semifinal. Um, against uh, Columbus, or I broke my ankle. And so I had to play with, with that for quite a long time, but I had to get it right, right? I needed a time to fix it. And no time's a good time, but, you know, this is life. So I had to, to, to fix a lot of things I've been playing with for a number of years. And I know it may seem that I can't play anymore, whatever it is, but that's with any athlete. My mistake was not fixing it in the moment. You know, I was thinking about what we can win, what we can accomplish, and I thought that was more important than, you know, getting that, that – uh, that treatment or that that surgery. So, looking back at it, I wouldn't change a thing because you know you gotta you gotta suffer sometimes to get what you want. And I think we accomplished some great things. And so I wouldn't change it for anything. What do you say to people, or, or what do you say to yourself when when people talk about the turf? It's always this, you know, with athletes, especially on the older side. Again, no, you're not old, but on the older side, <laughs> they always talk about the turf and like you're yeah. signing up for three years in New England on on turf. What do you think about that? Yeah, the turf is is difficult, obviously, for everybody, but we're going to train every every day on grass anyway and just play games on the turf. So, to be honest, I haven't thought much about it. Um, I haven't thought much about it, and so I'm just looking forward to playing. The game is the game, and and, and I'm just excited to to play games and and be on a a real competitive team and and, and looking to try to win another championship. That's all all I'm focused on. Feels kind of full circle for you with Bruce. Like teenage Josie, and now I mean, obviously, man Josie, like yeah. responsible, living his life with a, with the wife and family. Josie, <laughs> what what were you like with Bruce? What was that relationship like as a teenager, and how's it going to be different now? Um, I don't think it's it's different. I mean, Bruce is a guy that he just demands what he demands. So whether you're 16 or 25 or 33, 36, it doesn't matter. I think the demands are the same. That's that's what I've noticed is really cool about him. He hasn't changed. You know, he just wants to get on the field. He wants things to be clean. He wants you to be professional. He wants you to push yourself. And and it's the same now. So in that regard, it's easy to work with people like that because uh, they have a certain way of doing things that if you're serious at, at, at your craft and, and what you want to do, you have no problem being around people like that. So I see a lot of the same things in Bruce. And uh, I think uh, you look at the team he's been able to build here and how the guys have responded to him. They obviously see the same thing as well. Who does the best Bruce impression you've ever heard? <laughs> I've heard a lot. Um, I've heard a lot of them. Oh, fuck, man. Let me There's got to be somebody's got to stand out here. Um, I mean, Landon was pretty good. Landon was pretty good. <laughs> Landon, I mean, he got a lot of time. Yeah, he had he a lot, lot of time yeah. with him. So, but Landon was pretty good. He had the the just the voice and the the pauses and the the, you know the one-liners. He was he was Landon was pretty good. He had a good Bruce yeah. Bruce. Yeah, uh, I can only imagine. I we'll have to get that out of him someday. Uh, yeah. Tell me what Bruce. What's the discussion about role? Because when I look at this team, you have two base a two-headed monster from last year, fifteen goals apiece, basically with Buxa and with Bo. Here comes Josie. You know you have that capability. Buxa might get sold. TBD. When Bruce comes to you and says, "We want you. We want you for three years." What's the discussion about role between you two? Yeah, well, I mean, the three years part, I mean, I had two years already with Toronto. And I, I know you know how the MLS buyouts work. It's not like you just bounce. You know, I still have a contract. You know, I yep. have to learn all that as well. So, I mean, that's not really – wherever I went, I was going to have to play on that that contract anyway. So, and then in terms of Boo and, and Busca, first of all, quality, um, huge quality. Uh, both of these guys, just training with them and being around them, incredibly serious 
um, winners. And so you don't want to disrupt that. What you want to do is when you want to add something. And I spoke to Bruce about my role. And obviously, with where I am in my in my career, I was very open to, to coming here and, and understanding that you have to compete for a place. And not only that, if these guys are playing, what you can add when you play to help take the load off these guys. So I, I welcome that. Like I told you before, I, you know, I have no issue with that, especially with you know where I'm at in my career. I, I still want to be playing and challenging for minutes, but at the same time, I understand that if I have to take a step back, I have no issue with that at all. And these are very, very good strikers with Carlos in behind. So I just look to add to it whenever I can, help the team get more goals, help take the pressure off these guys and help us be more effective. I heard your uh, answer in Spanish and you were talking a lot about cups. What do you think this team can accomplish? Yeah, I think the, the MLS Cup is what we want to accomplish, right? I think they came close last year, obviously, with the Supporter Shield season. And it's hard to win Supporter Shield and then um, go on in the playoffs, you know? So I think the fact that they got to taste that, I think that's important. You, you taste what it's like to, to be at the top of the mountain. And so now the challenge is to be at the top of the mountain in the MLS Cup, in my opinion, um, and try to get through that, which is a new tournament. And I think they got to, to understand that, you know, yeah, we were the best, but that doesn't matter come MLS Cup time. It's how how quickly can you turn around and prepare for that tournament aspect. And I think they got the taste of that. And so what I want to do is just come in and try to bring that experience in and help them get over that hump. That's what we're all obsessed with. That's what we're all thinking about is trying to win an MLS Cup. Kind of feels like uh, like I'm, I'm on record many times over saying I love CCL. CCL is the most painful thing in the world to me sometimes, but I love it, and I'm desperate for an MLS team to win it. I know you said that this is a goal for the Revs. I'm more interested in sort of the institutional knowledge that you have of beating Liga MX teams, of being a team that stood toe-to-toe, of almost getting it done, if not for one or two breaks, of how an MLS team can do that. Like, what do you have to have? What do you have to do? What do you have to be able to deal with? What is the – is there a, a recipe here? Like, what are we missing, you know? I think it's it's interesting because in a lot of ways, the MLS Cup, it's so important to every MLS team. I, I didn't realize, obviously, I realized how much it is. But like when you play in both, MLS Cup is still prioritized in a lot of ways more than, than even the CCL to a lot of MLS Cup teams. So I, I, what I would like to see is, even if it's got to be me one day, I'm going to build a team one day just to win the championship. <laughs> Literally just for that, because I think it's so important for the league to win that because... To have an MLS team go to the FIFA World Club World Cup is huge. And to consistently have that, like they have in Liga MX, is only going to help in so many ways. So I think you have to build a team for that competition specifically. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's, it's difficult to do. MLS Cup is always the priority. What's that team like look like see... in your mind, though? Like, what's um, What would a team built for CCO look like? Experience, a deep team, and one that just says, hey, you know, this is all we care about. Um, this is all we're going to win. And I'm talking like... I'm taking my Revs and, and Toronto FC hat off. Just an, uh, an MLS supporter is what I am right now in this in this instance. So for what I would like to see is a team just say, okay, you know, this is how we're going to build the team with the, as most experience as we can, as most experience are guys that are that can play at that level because I think you need players that can play at that level when you play the league MX games. The stakes are high. And the level's a bit higher, uh, I'll just be honest with you. So I think that's what you have to build for. And I think one year I would love to see a team just put all the resources in, into into that and trying to go for broke in that competition. I know, obviously, then you have a league to play in, but you're not going to get relegated. Um, this is just, again, me as an MLS fan yeah, yeah. looking at this. You're not going to get relegated, so you'll be able to come back in the league next year. But obviously, I get that there's ownership and there's other things and, and what winning an MLS Cup does. So I get all those consequences. But one day, man, I would love to see a team just go for broke in that competition and, and try to win it. But it's easier said than done, as we all know. How much does that night in Guadalajara just kind of stick in your cross still? Oh, man, it's it's tough because we were right there. We were right there. We played so well. We pushed ourselves to the brink and... You know, people always say penalties is a crapshoot. It's not a crapshoot, man. It's not a, it's not a crapshoot. You know, I, I don't think our penalties were good. And in the end, uh, that's what cost us. But um, we are right there. But it's still another element of quality, of nerves, of dealing with pressure that we just weren't able to deal with at that time. But, man, I'm so proud of what we did and the run we made. But we were right there. You know, we lost that tie, I believe, in the, at home. You know, we could have scored a couple more goals and we didn't. But again, that's where that experience of being in these type of competitions comes from. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great try from us, but I, I want to see an MLS team win it so bad. I think it, it would really do a lot for the league. 
I heard you say when I build a team. <laughs> am I am I just am I just reading too much into something like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's for another saying. conversation. That's another oh, okay. conversation. Well, we're yeah. here. No, <laughs> no. I mean, it's it's definitely an aspiration, man. Yeah, you know, TBD. Stay tuned for that. You'll see. Okay. All right. I'll stay tuned. Uh, we have your your MLS Cup speech still running. You know, cook up some great stuff for you. That's what we're trying to do. Every show we do, we're trying to cook up some great stuff for folks out there. But in that speech, you also said, I'm TFC till I die. It's the longest, it's the most successful stop in your career. What place does that club and that city have in your heart? Oh, a lot, a lot, huge um, in different ways. You know, it's different for every club for the time in your life, right? It's different. But Toronto, like I told you, I never forget meeting the fans. And I'm talking at least a thousand people at that event saying, you know, we don't want to be laughed at anymore. You know, this is a city that if you win, you'll see what this city will become. And I was like, what are these people talking about? You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and just to see how much it meant to the to the people in Toronto, um, you, you had no other choice but to go out there and, and try to get it done, try to spill your guts out there. It's, it's different playing at BMO. Um, I think you've heard a lot of players tell you that playing home games at BMO is, is different. It's not your typical MLS market. There's a lot of people from all over the world coming to watch these games that are, you know, huge soccer fans. They know, they recognize when you get out of a tough, tough situation. They recognize good football. So it's a, it's a, it's a hotbed for, for the game. And it just, it meant the world to me to get over the hump because that's literally what we were brought there to do. Um, I'll never forget the conversations with Seba about what we're coming here to do. And literally Tim Lawicki said, listen, we're here to win a championship. We're here to transcend this market into into what I think it could be. And he had these graphs and his vision about where it would be if we won and how it would transcend soccer in, in, in Toronto and a little bit in Canada. And so to, to just have that come to fruition, it's amazing, man, because that's literally what we were brought there to do. And to, to, to come, to conquer that and say mission accomplished, it's not always you get to do that in your career. So that'll always have a special place for sure. I heard you talking about the, the exit. And we all saw last year, heard, you know, there, it seemed personal at times, the way things got. I don't want to get you in trouble here, but you, you said things like uh, the, the, the way of working, some of the morals didn't align. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not saying, hey, pull back this curtain, you got to tell us what happened, but... That that's those are powerful words. That feels like there's some real hurt for you in that situation. No, it's not hurt. It's like what I told you. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a game in Montreal. We were playing against Montreal, and we had agreed just to give you the clip notes. We had agreed with Montreal we weren't going to play the game. We were going to in in protest with the rest of the sports world at that time. Uh, Thierry Henry. And all of us, a few of us, not all. I won't say all because all the guys want to preview that conversation. We had said we're not going to play this game. And then literally at, you know, 1 a.m. or whatever it is, you know, on our side, we decide we're going there to take three points. No matter what happens, we're going to go play this game. And, you know, just looking at the situation, there's a lot more that goes into that. You know, I'm a man of my word and, and telling a guy like that who was my idol and, and, and the guys that were on that call, we're not going to play and switch on them like that. And then you saw they said I played I didn't play the game for personal reasons. That's not I didn't play the game because you said we we're going to play the game. And then we switched yep. on them. You know, listen, I get both sides in terms of, oh, maybe it was gamesmanship, this and that. At the end of the day, there was something much bigger going on in the world than a game. And no disrespect to Montreal, we had their number. And I love playing against Montreal more than anybody. To play against them a day later, not going to do much. But the message that could have accomplished would have done a lot. And so there were different situations. Again, there's a lot more that goes into that. There are different situations like that to where when the morals don't align anymore, when people see things this way, that way, whatever, you know, and at that time, what was going on in the country, it was a big conversation. It was an important time. And so, like I said, you're allowed to have difference of opinion. But there was a time where that game wouldn't have been played. You see what I'm saying? And so yeah. at the end of the day, man, like you just you lose a little bit, you know, you lose a little bit for what you're fighting for. And, and those people that you're fighting with, it just it doesn't become the same when that happens one, two, three, four times in different scenarios, in different ways. You know, it's not the place you walked into, and that's okay. That's life. That's sports, and 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 I'm learning that as a man, you know, as a as a father, and all that. That's life, and so I hold no grudges. But like I said before, you know, I'll never forget, you know, talking to Henri, you know, who was my idol growing up after that game or before the game, and talking to him for 30 minutes about life, and you know, we leave that conversation. He's like, man, I have so much respect for you, for you, you know, for doing what you're doing right now. And it, that means a lot to me, and that means more to me than the game on that night. And like I said, it was something that not a lot of people were privy to. Um, there was only a few people on both sides. But when certain things, like I told you, happen that you feel as a person that 
it wasn't like that when you walked into that situation and it happens a few more times in different ways, it's hard to get out there, man, and just do what you want to do because you're, you're, about, you're around people that just don't have, that don't share that same vision as you. And it's difficult to be in places like that when, when that happens. If people that are wondering, oh, what, what's Josie talking about here? It's the boycotts from 2020. And if yes, you want to go I'm back sorry, on our yeah. podcast feed, yeah, if you want to go back on our podcast feed, we had interviews with seven guys the day afterwards. Uh, kind of walking you through why they made that decision, why it was important to them. I think uh, even now it can kind of feel like so much has happened. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, God, crazy. it can feel it can feel like the last two years were a lifetime. Yeah. It can feel like that's so long ago, but it's not. I, I'm curious, and, and we'll just jump into this right now. What what have you learned about the business of sport from an athlete's perspective? You've been doing this half your life. Yeah. Like, w- you've seen it all. W- what have you learned about the way this game works from a business perspective? That business comes first. <laughs> At the end of the day, business comes first. And it's a, it's a harsh reality. It's a harsh lesson to learn, but... You know, you, you grow tougher and your skin grows thicker because of it. But at the end of the day, it's a business. And as much as you hear people say that, I'm telling you right now, that's all that matters. It's a business and the numbers are important to, to and I get it. You know, people are have money on the line. I 100 percent get it. So I've just learned that that outweighs everything. And uh, yeah, it's unfortunate at times, but I understand why that is. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm oblivious to that. I 100 percent get that. Uh <sighs> What what is the what is the decision that you maybe made as a let's say you know you're you're a professional athlete as a businessman that you do you have any regrets in that sense like man I went here too soon or I did this too quick or I didn't have enough patience in this moment is there something that you would you would go back and be like hey younger Josie here's here's what I would tell you about that situation you're about to get into um yeah for sure there are certain moments where I had the wrong people around me that uh you know pushing me to make decisions that deep down I didn't want to make, but, you know, maybe for other reasons, it made sense for a lot of other people. And, you know, I think that that's life. And and there was probably hundreds of athletes I can say the same thing. And that's how you just grow and learn and, and understand and try to give back to the next generation, how important it is the people around you, especially when you're young, um, to make sure you have the right people around you who have your best interests at heart. You hear the people say that all the time, but it is huge because when you're young and these decisions come, it's hard because you don't want to disappoint people. And it's easy to say now, oh, man, F that. I would have did this. I would have chose that for me or whatever. But it's hard when you have the weight of your family, um, you know, agencies, whatever it is. It's hard to, to you don't want to disappoint people. You don't want to make yeah. people, you know. And so that's what I would say, just to have thicker skin in these moments. Obviously, I would tell young Josie, do what Josie wants to do. Um, <laughs> and so it's easier said than done. But like I said, you, you grow stronger for it. And, and I'm happy I went through some of these things because, you know, I can – you know, give back to the next generation if they ask, if they need, or whatever it is. Uh, young players that reach out to me, I try to give them that advice and, and just be upfront and, and straight with them about it. Uh, how, what, what role has Yuri Jorkaev played in your career? Because I, I saw a quote that you were saying he's he's really sort of been a mentor for you, and, and the quote was, hey, hey, Josie, maximize your career. I wonder what you what what that means to you. Yeah, man, Yuri, when I was at Red Bull, he'd always used to tell me that, like, maximize everything. You know, whether it's whatever it is, business, the game, like get what you can out of it because it goes quickly. And, you know, it, it, it was funny at that time because I was like 16 looking at thinking of this guy. Like, what are you talking about? You know, like, what do you mean by that? But now as I get older, I understand it. You know, I understand that you got to be you got to make sure that you, you do everything you can do, whether it's playing, whether it's uh, financially, whether it's investments, whether whatever it is. He always used to hint, hint at these things. And I was like, what is he talking about? But now I get it. I'm growing older. I understand that. Whatever it is you're doing, you got to try to, to maximize and get the most and, and, and the best you can out of it for you and, 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 and keep building forward with whatever it is. And he was always working on a lot of different things off the field, on the field. He always used to say that. So it definitely hits harder now um, as you grow older and uh, understand things in a different light. I see all these these kids now following the path that you blazed so long ago, it now feels like. You know, MLS is changing. And, and when you went, it was like, oh, you were, you were this, like, shooting star outlier. We didn't have Josie Altidore's running around. Now we got Kevin Paredes. We got, you know, fill in the blank of this offseason, of Dude. guys going to big European clubs for millions of dollars. What are those guys in for? First of all, you love to see it, man. I love it. I love it all. I try to, you know, I, it's so great to see because there's so much talent in this country, and it's finally getting recognized and seen, you know. So shout out to all those kids, Paredes, 
what a what a transfer for him. I saw his goodbye, and I know that position. What it's it beautiful. Like. Yeah, to play for your childhood club and all that. So so happy for him and. And yeah, man, I'm just excited for these guys because we need more of these kids doing that. It's tough, man. You go out there 18, you don't know nobody, the language is hard, but it's going to make them stronger people and players for it. So it's only going to bring and, and raise the quality of our game, of our national team. And so I'm just I'm just happy to see it. And I want to see more and more guys keep challenging themselves to do that at the, those ages because it'll also set you up for later in life too, you know, um, in a lot of ways. So you make that move, you go out there, pay your dues, It'll set you up later on, too. So uh, and you'll, you'll be able to climb the ladder and, you know, different things will happen for different players. Some will make it to Chelsea, some won't. But that's life. Right. And that's 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 what it is. But at the end of the day, you got to push yourself. You got to go chase it and, and see what happens. So I love all these young kids doing that. And, and I think it's amazing to see. And I think as an American fan, I hope a lot of American fans are happy to see that, you know. Do you get them dropping into your DMs? Do you, do you get kids reaching out? Sometimes, man, sometimes. And, and I think it's kind of cool. And I always tell these guys, you know, go for it, man. You know, go for it. Whoever asks me, I tell them to go for it. Um, you know, MLS will be here. But these windows, these opportunities to go to those clubs, it won't be here at the end of the day. You know, they want you now when you're young. They see potential in you. Go get it. You know, go after it. Have no regrets. And, you know, if you shoot for the stars, man, you'll land somewhere, you know, in, in yeah, a good yeah. spot. So. There's a big galaxy. It's a big galaxy, man. A lot of possibilities. So, like I said, I love to see these kids go out there and do what they're doing and and kind of get out of their comfort zone. And it's cool to see. But on the flip side, too, on the flip side of that, I want to see some of these young kids get paid in MLS. I do decide to stay. You know, I do decide to to, to to play in their home markets or boyhood clubs. I want to start seeing those guys get these million-dollar deals. I think that's important because – kids behind them will see and be like, you know, they want to be like them. You know, there, there should be multiple avenues. Just because you stay here at 1920 and get paid don't mean you can't go to Europe later too to a big club. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I also want to start to see that too. Um, and I think we will because the league is, is ever changing all the time. I want it to be aspirational, right? You want to have you want to have kids that are coming up look on Instagram and be like, Jesus Ferreira right? just whipped the rolls. Shout into, out to Jesus, man. Yeah, <laughs> he, just, exactly. he just got paid. Like, he look at that. Paid. You want to see that, man. That's important to see. And then, yeah, to, to your point, you definitely want to see that side too. So uh, in this other galaxy I'm looking at here, there's a fit and productive Josie Altidore and the U.S. national team. We need a number nine that has all the things that you have. You were in camp just last January. What role do you think you could play with this team? Do you think you can make it into the team before the World Cup? Is that a goal? It's not even my thought process right now, man. It's not my thought process right now. I'm not even thinking about any of that. Um, I'm just, you know, first of all, I've loved watching the games. It's kind of odd, but <laughs> I've loved watching at home these guys. Like, they're young, hungry, they're going for it. And uh, it's been really oddly satisfying watching them play and compete and have the run they've run so far, you know, on the brink of qualification. You know, hopefully we, they can they can get it over the line and, and keep pushing, but – I'm being completely honest with you. I, I have not. Um, I've had a lot going on in my own life with my own stuff. And uh, the biggest thing for me is just to to get back on the field and just play. And the chips will fall for the, where they may. But that that's the I, I don't want to sound weird, but, you know, I'm a competitor. But that's really the last thing on my mind right now, because I have to get myself right and just contribute to my team before I can think about anything else. No, not even a little inkling in your brain. Not even a little dream or a little just like look, not man, even that look, little bit. Look, everybody's a dreamer. You wanna of course you wanna go to the World Cup's an amazing thing. Playing for the national team is the greatest thing, you know, I've been able to do in my career. But at the end of the day, you know, as a pro there are steps to everything. You know, there are steps. Mm-hmm. And first like, I just wanna get I wanna be happy playing soccer. That's all I wanna think about. And I wanna contribute to a very, very strong competitive team in New England and help win an MLS Cup. And that's that's all that's on my mind right now. All right, I respect that, man. Got to get, the like you said, steps up the ladder. Let's talk about that team, though, because I see you on Instagram. I see you big up up in these guys, and they are so fun to watch. Young, brash at these incredible clubs, so much personality. Who, like, who do you like to watch? Who are the guys that you like to follow? Um... All of them, man. I love <laughs> I love watching all of them. I, it's hard to single out one guy. I, I, I really enjoyed Weston. You know, Weston's a great kid. When you you know when you meet him and you're around him, his energy. You know, he's a guy that's hard to not like. He's such a sweetheart. Um, 
He's a competitor. And I, and I just love watching him in Juventus constantly push himself, try new things, uh, whether it's his dribbling, his passing. You know, he's really going for it in every way. So he's been tremendous to watch. Obviously, Christian, you know, I was with him in the National when he was 17. And to see his growth, you know, he has a lot to deal with, injuries and all these things. So to see him fight through those things and continue to have success, you know, it's so great to see. Um, you know, it, it's hard to single out one guy. But like I said, you know, Zach, obviously, as well, um, doing what he's doing at Man City is, is exciting. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of Luca De La Torre. He's in the Eredivisie, and I love his yeah. style, and I, and I love that league. I think it's a very, very competitive league that's played at a high level. And I think you see that in how he plays. You know, he doesn't look um, off it at all. He looks like he belongs, and that's a testament to where he plays. So I love all those guys, man. I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of what they're doing. And like I told you, watching the games has been oddly satisfying in a lot of ways. Watching, you know, because you would think you want to be there, but I'm just a fan. And, you know, I'm watching with my son and teaching him about the game. It's so much fun. And and I'm very prideful. You know, I love that jersey. And to see these kids turn the program around, it's, it's amazing. They're not kids anymore. They're big boys, now, <laughs> you know. So it's been exciting. Tyler as well. I've got Tyler Adams. So it's hard to single out one guy because, you know, I follow all of them. I watch all of them. And I'm so proud of of the success I've had at the club level and national team level. Six of 11 starters in the last qualifier were black men. What does that mean to you? It's beautiful, man. It's beautiful to see in a lot of ways because it's, it's, it's a lot of strides we're making in the program um, with, with identifying these guys, giving them an opportunity. I think that's great to see. and That's a great representation of our country. Um, you know, you want to see all types in the national team because they deserve one because they deserve to be there, but also you know to not um, not pick them because of anything else. And I think the national team has done a great job uh, of identifying talent from all walks of life, where it's Latin, black, white, whatever it is. Um, I think they've done a great job of doing that. And there's so many more, right? There's so many more talented players that come from different nationalities that we have to identify and give a chance. It's, it's to our advantage, right? It's to our advantage being the USA and being a melting pot. So I think it's it's a beautiful thing to see. And, and hopefully we can just keep combining that and finding the best combinations to put on the field. I read a wonderful piece uh, on MLSsoccer.com and really happy to have Demarcus Beasley there sharing his voice about his upbringing and what he experienced uh, and one of the things he was saying is, you know, guys like you and, and Mo and others that looked at him and said, hey, man, I, I saw myself in you on the field. And he was saying, but this next generation, what they're doing, they're taking it even a step for, a step farther. What do you think about about black players for change, about what's happening in the league, about the, the minority hiring initiative? What do you think about the progress being made? And maybe where do we still need to make progress? Because obviously we still need to make progress outside of all that. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to Bees' point, I think that's huge. You know, there's nothing better than when you see a young kid coming up saying, hey, I watched you and, you know, you helped. You were my favorite player and I saw myself in you. You know, that, that that's amazing. You know, you need representation. And so you look at this new group and you imagine the kids across America that are watching Sergio Des and, and Weston and saying, you know, I want to go play at Juventus and, and, and play for the night. And do, it's it's it's. In, I can't tell you how important that is, because if you don't see somebody like you doing it, it's hard to imagine yourself doing it, right? That's just the world. So to see that is is amazing, man. And these guys are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. The flag was passed to them, and they're making new strides. And I think it's it's not for everybody, but I think they've taken it upon themselves to do that. And I think that's what makes them even more um, incredible young men, because I see that in, in Weston. Every time he takes the field, he wants to to set the bar even higher. And I think that's important. Um, and to the other part of your question, um, you know, I think we've made a lot of great strides, but, you know, the questions have to be asked. You know, you look at DeMarcus Beasley. For me, he's arguably top five U.S. men's and African players of all time in terms of his accolades, what he's able to accomplish in Europe. And my man, you know, he's got no real position, you know, within the leagues, within U.S. soccer. You know, you need those guys passing on their expertise to the next generation. And then also when you're when you're in coachings and, and, and you're playing on these teams and you have the coaching staffs and, and even in the league, when you have these staffs, you need a, a representation of all sides. And, you know, for a guy like Bees, I think it's 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 a it's a misstep. You know, you need these guys back in the program, feeding their knowledge, what they learned, you know, their experiences to the next generation. It's incredibly important and it's, it's a missed opportunity. So hopefully a guy like that can 
to get in the door somewhere and we can we can get him, you know, passing on what he's learned. I mean, think about the teams this man's played for, you know, the yeah, players crazy. he's played with, right? It's we, crazy we, to need, me. we need that. We need that not only for for our black representation, but also for our youth players, man. You know, we need to do more of getting our former guys that have played at high levels, educating and being part of that youth development side. What would you change structurally? Is there anything you would change? Um, like, what do you mean? Uh, it, is there a, I don't know, we have the minority initiative that's like a rule and there's punishments, but is there something you would change? Or is, I, I don't, I'm trying to find some sort of actionable thing that we can all think about or that we can do or that you can bring, we can bring in our own, our mindsets, our processes, everything that we do. Um, it's tough, you know, it's, it's tough. It's a tough question to answer because it's still an old boys club in a lot of ways, man. It's an old boys club. It's an old boys club where there's certain people that control everything. You know what it looks like on the outside, but I'm telling you, there's certain people at certain places they control everything. Who who coaches, who plays, what players come in and out, and that stuff's got to change. It's got to be more of a collective thing, and it's got to be more of, you know, everybody has equal treatment, um, but you're not seeing that. I'm telling you from experience that that is still going on, and that stuff, it, it just has to change. Uh, let's do some rapid fire and get you out of here. I know you got lunch, and I don't want to keep you hungry, man. I appreciate eat, all your gotta time. Eat, man. This, gotta this eat. has been Stay this strong, has been man. wonderful. Ah. Uh, you're eating better than I am, yeah. <laughs> or you're doing something else. You're doing something else better than I am. I think is is probably more uh, more likely there. Let's do some rapid fire here. Uh, you said I'm a villain in my own country, and I accept it. What do you think about social media? Um, to each his own with it. I don't have. You know, I don't love it or hate it. I like to be. You know, I have to use it. Obviously, we all have to have it and use it. Uh, it's important for brands and all that. But I don't try to do too much on it just because I don't like to give people too much access. Um, but I, I'm not against people that use their advantage, right, and and give a lot to themselves. I just think you got to be smart with it. you got to be careful with it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous tool if you use the wrong way. So just got to be mindful of what we're doing on there. That's all. And myself included. Myself included because yep. I know I've been <laughs> – I know I said some things on there that rub people the wrong way, uh, so myself included. Trust me. Hey, man, more people with personality, more people willing to share what they think. That's what that's what our soccer culture needs, not the other way around on it. Who's your best friend in the game? Best friend in the game? Uh, oof, probably Sebastian Jovinko. Interesting. Yeah. Very, very cool. My other question was the teammate you had the most chemistry on the field with, and I think that probably answers both those questions, oh, right? Oh, boy. Yeah, Sebastian. It's amazing. All right. All right. Sebastian Jovinko. Best U.S. M&T player ever, in your opinion? Ever? Ever. Oof. All time. All time? Clint Dempsey. I like the answer. I Clint like the Dempsey. answer. Most memorable goal of your career. Could be internationally. Could be club. Um... I have two. I have three. My first goal ever. <laughs> my first goal ever. Obviously, I'll never forget that goal. Was it the uh, bouncing half volley? Was it a bouncing half volley? Yeah, was it? Was that the one that kind of had the had the little the bit the left to right bend? Maybe that was a couple in. I don't remember. Uh, no, it was, it was Columbus. Columbus. Back in the day. It was against Columbus. I know Bruce just threw me out. He's like, "Hey, kid, get in there. You got to go in." <laughs> and I went in there and a bomb. That was my first goal ever. And then obviously the goal against Spain because. I think that goal, a lot of kids at home saw the goal, and I think moments like that are important for the next generation. I saw people come up to me today and be like, man, that goal, whatever that moment, uh, you know, did a lot for me. I think moments like that are huge. And then cup goal for Azad Alkmaar against PSV in the cup final because uh, that was an incredible moment. I always wanted to play in the cup final in Europe, and it may be whatever to some people, but for me it meant a lot to beat, you know, that team on that day, which was a lot of good players. That was, that was amazing. You know, both sides of fans. That was that was dope. Uh, we would I would do a whole another podcast with you just talking about your different stops over the years. We don't have time for that, so I have one more question. Cool. What happened in that tunnel in 2017 against the Red Bulls? Oh man, let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. And I still tell. What was, uh, it was it was was it, the referee was Petrescu? Who was the referee? I think I think it was Silvio, but I'd have to go Silvio, back. Silvio, man, I don't know what Silvio saw. Okay, I'm telling you to this day. I never punched Sasha. He said he saw me punch uh, punch Sasha in the face. And Sasha will tell you, they saw the wrong guy, man. I ain't going to snitch on nobody, but <laughs> I didn't punch Sasha. I don't know what he saw, but I never punched him. 
know, me and Sasha laugh, laugh about that now to this day. Like, I was gonna say, I got in his DMs the other day because I was I prepping for this, him, and he said, you. he said, he said, he said, tell Josie I would have, I would have whooped him. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. It never got there. And like, it was crazy because that whole process, they were like, you punch Sasha and that can't happen. I'm like, guys, like, I never, like, that never happened. It was just, listen, a lot was happening in that tunnel. Trust me, I get it. Everybody was, it was crazy. So I understand how people can say they saw one thing and it was another. I totally understand it. But that's like the biggest misconception. No, we didn't throw no punches at each other. It wasn't even like that. It was, we definitely scuffled. Me and a few of their guys, but there was no punches thrown. It didn't get to that level. The aftermath got crazy, as you saw. But yeah, it was it was wild. But I loved it, man. It's a memory. It's one of the all time moments, man. It was oh, crazy. it is. It's, it's a wonderful memory. If you don't have just little fuzzies coming back to you from that one, you don't love playoff soccer. Josie, we appreciate your time, man. Thank you no so problem. much for stopping by. Thank you, thank you for having me. Congratulations, you made it through more than an hour of extra time. That means you love the show. And if you love the show, you probably want more episodes. Click right here for more episodes of Extra Time and here to subscribe to the MLS YouTube channel. Thanks for following along.